Shalom and uh, welcome to the Middle East Report. In this programme today we'll be marking the 50th anniversary of God's deliverance of Israel during the Yom Kippur War. Welcome to the program and today's special guest needs no introduction, uh, Robin Benson. It's great to have you on the Middle East Report, um, one of my regular guests for this program and uh, really appreciate what you bring to this program and your contribution, your love and devotion to the God of Israel, but also to for teaching the uh, Hebrew roots of our faith as well. So much appreciated. Thank you for the opportunity, Simon. It's a pleasure. Um, and, and Robin, we are in this programme today uh, marking the 50th anniversary of God's deliverance of, of Israel during the war that was known as the Yom Kippur War because it occurred on Saturday the 6th of October uh, 1973 that took Israel by complete surprise. But why is it so important that we um, mark this 50th anniversary uh, and why is this historical occasion so important? Well, of course, from a biblical perspective, 50 years is the Jubilee, going back to the Torah. So, I mean, that was a time <clears throat> to rejoice and thank the Lord for his deliverance, for his provision. And that's very much a case of what went on during the, few the two weeks, effectively, that the Yom Kippur uh, War lasted. But it's also <clears throat> looking at it more, maybe from a more human perspective. You and I know from having visited that part of the world, that honour and shame are very much part of Middle Eastern culture. So for the, the, the Arab countries that banded together to attack Israel, there, it was out of a sense of shame for the loss of the previous defeat back in 1967. And, <clears throat> and therefore that sort of compounds the whole of the story because that is what was underlying their desire to wipe Israel off the map once and for all. So, you know, again, looking back over 50 years, it is, as you said in the introduction, it's a time to really thank God for what was uh, uh, his deliverance in a very extreme situation, very extreme situation. And when we talk about um, the, the Yom Kippur War, as, as you mentioned, just now, we have mm. to mention the Six Day War, the, mm. um, the incredible miracle and the triumph of Israeli forces that uh, felt that Israel was going to face um, annihilation before that, uh, before that war. Uh, the uh, leader of Egypt, um, President Gabdel Abdel Nasser, was inflaming the Arab street. The Arab street were demanding that uh, the Egyptians um, invade Israel. Uh, we saw then that they removed the UN peacekeeping forces that had been put there after the Suez was crisis of 56 um, to keep the peace. Uh, we see that they um they blocked the Straits of uh, Tehran to uh, Israeli shipping. We had Syria bombing um, Israeli kibbutzim and bombing, bombing f uh, fishing boats on the Sea of Galilee. And so the, in May of 1967, the, the is situation that Israel faced was incredibly dangerous and precarious. And then, of course, we have the miracle of the Six Day War that within six days, mm. Israel had tripled the yeah. territory. Um, just share with us why it's so important that when we reflect back 50 years to the Yom Kippur War, that we also need to discuss the Six Day War and put it in its context. Well, again, coming back to the issue of Arab shame and, and honor culture, I mean, effectively, the Six Day War set in, we, in motion the wheels that led to the Yom Kippur War because Israel had so unexpectedly gained so much territory, had destroyed so much of the allied Arab infrastructure as far as its military was concerned. There was this um, deep-seated desire for revenge built on top of the ongoing 
desire to see Israel wiped off the map. That had been there since 19, well, before 1948, but certainly since 1948, and the reconstitution of Israel as a modern nation state. You know, the Arabs call it the Nakba, the, the catastrophe, the disaster. And that has been part of the Arab psyche in the Middle East and further afield, but certainly in the Middle East for all of that time. And you then get hotheads like Abdul you know, Gamal Nasser come along, who have the charisma to not only draw in the leaders of other Arab nations, but actually the Arab peoples as a whole, and just, as you say, inflame the whole situation and build up and build up and build up until Israel had no other option. I mean, if they had waited for the Arab nations who did eventually respond to attack first, we would have had Yom Kippur six years earlier. And who knows what the situation, well, okay, we're, we're, we're talking as if God is not an equation, and he is, but again, on a completely human level, the odds were stacked against Israel, numbers-wise, in 67, again in 73. So you have to bring God into the occasion from our, you know, from our perspective. But looking at it from a completely human perspective, Israel had no other option because of the the warmongering and the bellicose statements that were coming out of Egypt in particular, but others joined in. I mean, Jordan was drawn into the fray. Syria was quite happy to come into the fray in 67. You've got Iraq, you've got Lebanon, you've got Saudi Arabia, and you know several other major Arab states were actually drawn into that conflict. They actually had soldiers involved in the 67 conflict, even though the bulk of it came from Egypt and, and, and Syria. So it really was a wholehearted attempt that was thwarted by Israel's preemptive strike and again wiping the Jewish state off the map. Also, Robin, I think we also when we're discussing the Yom Kippur War, which was the uh, which occurred on Saturday, the uh, 6th of October, 1973, um, many historians will look at this only purely in it in the as in terms of the Arab-Israeli conflict, that essentially it was a surprise attack by Egypt and the Syrians that took Israel by complete surprise. But we have to put this in, in its historical context of the Cold War, that uh, you know after the Second World War, um, two world empires emerged, that of the Soviet Union and that of the United States, and those were the two superpowers, and everyone uh, in the world was either in the Soviet camp or in the American camp. Of course, Israel was in the American camp, uh, but at this time, it was only after 67 that the, uh, the Americans started to fund and supply military aid and, and uh, military hardware to Israel. Prior to that, they didn't do that at all. So um, uh, how important is it that when we look at this conflict that this wouldn't have actually happened had it not been for the Soviet Union on a number of, of fronts? Uh, the first thing, they would have given the green light for the attack from the Egyptians and the uh, Syrians, but also their massive rearmament and supply of uh, both Syria and, and also um, Egypt as well. Just share with us how this war wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for the Soviet Union. Well, you've got the factors that you've already mentioned, and, and Russia was the almost sole source of armaments flooding into many of these Arab nations. But there's also the factor that the Russians were feeding a misinformation and a disinformation. This is before these terms even you know, came into existence. They're part of our just everyday parlance today. But they were certainly feeding all sorts of disinformation and information to both sides. They were giving false assurances, uh, to, particularly to the Arab nations, that, that Israel would not respond, that Israel would not reta you know, retaliate, which only egged the Arab nations on because they thought, you know, it's in the bag. We can do whatever we want. We've got the Russians behind us. I mean, the Americans were not wholly on Israel's side at that point. They were more sort of standing back and almost um, pleading neutrality. Things obviously changed, but at the outset, the Americans actually were, were you know, indifferent to, towards what was going on. They, in some senses, didn't want to get involved. So that only played into the hands of the Russians yet again in fomenting just the strife and, and politically, uh, diplomatically, militarily, just throwing petrol onto the fire. Yeah. And also, do you think this is also that the United States and the, um, the Nixon and Kissinger administrations were very much kind of tied up 
with the uh, war in Vietnam and Cambodia, yeah. uh, and this is where America's focus was. So they didn't really focus on what was happening. I mean, that, that's true. That, that's true. But some of the things that I've read would also, I, I, I'm, I'm sure, I hope it's not unfair, would, would paint Kissinger as actually verging on anti-Israel. He yeah. certainly was not supportive. You know, and, and in his own way with the, the influence that he had was actually seeking to undermine Israel's um, diplomatic face in the, in the world at the time, such as, it, you know, such as it was. So Israel, I mean, Kissinger, I would say, was no friend of Israel. Of course, then he's advising the president and the president's team, you know, as one of their main advisors. So, you know, at the early stages, they're taking on board with this yeah, recognized international diplomat and advisor was saying and listening to him. I think the famous quote was, uh, we need Israel to take uh, a bloody nose. Yes. So that we can restore the honor yeah. of the Arabs and to negotiate a kind of peace treaty. So yes. I agree with you on that one. And um, Robin, um, before we actually mention uh, the build up as we're, we're talking, the, the build up and the context of, of the Yom Kippur War, it's also important to mention the kind of a war of attrition. Um, that occurred between 1969 and uh, 1970, um, when the Soviets were supplying um, surface-to-surface -surface air missiles to the Egyptian forces, and they would constantly attack Israel along um, what was known as the Sinai, mm. al along the, uh, the River Nile, mm. um, in order to erode Israel's military presence in the Sinai. And there's one um, incredible story in July 1970 when the Israeli Air Force, and they're flying the US F-4 Phantoms, um, shot down five uh, Soviet MiGs-21s, uh, mm. um, but the pilots were not actually Egyptians, but they were actually Soviets. Mm. Uh, and they were some of the best uh, fighter pilots in the entire Soviet Union. Uh, and Israel then was the only nation ever to engage the Soviet Union in air combat uh, during the Soviet <laughs> War. I mean, you can tell that I, I, I love aviation and military history. So yeah, I mean, uh, and you I think, think that's think it, I mean, you think about the, the reality of what you've just said. Here is pardon the expression, this puny little Middle Eastern nation, this strip of land at the eastern end of the Mediterranean Sea, able to give the might of the Soviet Union a bloody nose, to use the expression. You know, it must have, it must have so humiliated the, you know, the, the Russian command structure to see these four you know, aircraft shot down and the fact that it exposed Russia's, you know, intrinsic involvement in what was going on in keeping this conflict between Israel and, and Egypt in particular going at the time. This is before, you know, any major conflict has broken out. Yeah. And one thing I love about looking at, at um, history, Robin, is that uh, over a period of time, we have fresh evidence, we have fresh information that comes to light that gives us a complete different picture of, uh, of what happened 50 years ago during the Yom Kippur War. Because the, the general narrative when it comes to the Yom Kippur War is that the Soviet Union took a neutral position Regarding the um, regarding that war, when new evidence has, has come to light, particularly from the Jerusalem Post, that mentioned that, um, uh, let me get my notes. So Anwar Sadat, who replaced um, President Nasser, Nasser mm. as uh, as um, the president of Egypt, I think that was in 1970, on the 18th of July uh, 1972. Um, he expelled 15,000 to 20,000 Soviet military advisors that had been stationed in Egypt um, prior to the Six Day War. Um, and it's believed that this is part of a grand deception uh, to convince Israel and the Americans that the Soviets were no longer seeking Russian military or uh, political help. Uh, and, um, and this also helped to create a kind of apathy amongst mm. Israeli leaders and the Americans that, you know, the Soviets are not pushing the Egyptians and the Syrians into war. You don't have to worry. The President um, Assad has kicked out 15 or 20,000 mm. Soviet military advisors. Uh, and this was part of the deceptive plan to launch yeah. a few months later, yeah. the Yom Kippur War. Yeah, I mean, so, so, I mean, it's interesting, of course, Sadat is the guy who ended up paying for making peace with Israel for his life many years later.
But at this point, he is playing a really interesting political and diplomatic game because it's, I mean, Israel is looking at what's going on in Egypt. She's looking at what's going on in Syria. She's seeing the buildup of forces to some degree or other. And yet the noises that are coming from Sadat are peaceful noises. You know, he is playing a highly deceptive game, trying to convince Israel that there's nothing coming. And the problem is that many of the Israeli upper echelon in the IDF and the, you know, the intelligence services were seeing what was actually happening on the ground, but they were listening to the noises that were coming from the politicians, particularly in Cairo, and they were believing the words that were coming from the politicians and not forming their decisions based upon what their eyes could actually see going on in the ground. And that's part of the reason that you know, Israel was caught on the wrong foot when the conflict actually broke out, because they did not believe what their eyes were telling them. So uh, let's have a look at this uh, archive uh, video footage, and this is thanks to the IDF. And uh, this is the IDF radio broadcast that occurred on Shabbat on Saturday, the 6th of October, 1973, to launch, uh, to announce that the Egyptians and the Syrians had invaded Israel. ומאזינים לגלי צה"ל, שידורי צבא ההגנה לישראל. דובר צה"ל מודיע כי היום, סמוך לשעה שתיים בצהריים, פתחו הכוחות המצריים והסוריים בהתקפה בסיני וברמת הגולן, וכוחותינו פועלים נגד התוקפים. כתבינו מוסרים כי בשל פעולות של מטוסים סוריים בגזרת רמת הגולן, נשמעות ברחבי הארץ ספירות עולות וגרדות. אלה הן ספירות אמת. And uh, thanks to the IDF uh, for their archive footage of the IDF radio announcement that the Syrians and the Egyptians had invaded Israel back on Saturday, the 6th of October, 1973. Um, Robin, when we look at the, uh, the invasion force, and I, I'm just talking about the Egyptian invasion force alone that wanted to, uh, that entered into the Sinai. Mm. Um, it was a huge um, scale of forces. So some 600,000 uh, Egyptian soldiers, uh, together with 2,000 tanks, 550 Soviet aircraft against only 500 Israeli uh, troops stationed in the Sinai. Uh, and share with us how Israel was totally overwhelmed by this. <laughs> well, you and I, I think, have probably been in Israel on Yom Kippur. So we know what it's like <clears throat> because it's the same all over the country as far as the Jewish community is concerned. Most Jewish men in particular, as well as families, will be in the local synagogue for the Yom Kippur services, which are actually quite long. You know, it's a long liturgy that they, that they work through, that they pray through, sing through, read through on Yom Kippur. So Israel was totally unprepared for what was unleashed because of the reasons I said. They didn't believe it, it actually was going to happen. Of course, the enemy picks the day in the year when basically the whole nation is shut down as far as any activity is concerned. I mean, there's no buses, there's no trains, there's nothing. Most folk are in, in synagogue or they're at home with families, you know, um, going through the, fa the day of the fast. So it, it's, I don't think we can, unless you've actually lived in Israel on that day, you cannot grasp what a shock that must have been to the whole nation. And it took quite a while to mobilize everybody because out up in the Kibbutzim, some of them had no telephones. They might have had the odd radio, there was no television. And if the telephone was ringing, because it was Yom Kippur, you, to pick up the telephone is work. If it's a religious kibbutz or moshav, so getting the, getting the call out for people, some of whom have actually just finished their service and gone back to normal everyday life, to get them mobilized and back to their units, wherever the units are, is a major feat. 
that, and it's obvious that it took Israel quite a number of hours to get the momentum going and get people to where they needed to be so that they could repel this invasion that is coming from several directions. So it's no wonder that the Arab forces that are come pouring into the nation, up into the Golan, into the Sinai, got as far as they did because there was so little to resist them. And also, I mean, putting this in context for, for our younger viewers watching, um, you know, there was no social media, there was no, no internet access at all. It was just telephone communication, maybe a radio and the report. Sirens. And, the sirens. Uh, and the sirens as well, yeah. and, and black and white TV reports. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, it's, it's but, a very but, but different... Hardly anybody would have had those things on because it's Yom Kippur. Exactly, exactly. I mean, if you're in a secular kibbutz or a secular moshav, you know, a farming community, maybe, but maybe not. So, so in other words, the nation is almost deaf to the call that's going out, help. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, uh, why do you think the Israeli uh, government of uh, Golda Meir were taken by surprise? And also we see that the then Defence Minister, Mushi Dayan, uh, famous for being the Chief of Staff during the Six Day War and mm -hmm. one of the coordinators of the Six Day War, um, actually said that Israel could not launch a preemptive strike as they did in June 1967, because the political situation was very different and Israel had to absorb that attack to show that she was being attacked first yeah. despite the huge loss of life yeah. uh, in the early stage of the war. I mean, this is where we've got international politics coming into play because, yes, that going back to the Six Day War in 1967, that was a complete turnaround about what many of the nations of the world then thought of this little nation state. It changed Israel's reputation on a worldwide scale. Israel was no longer perceived, rightly or wrongly, it was no longer perceived as the underdog, the victim. And you're right, there, was, there are those in the government who felt we, even though they thought that maybe they should take preemptive action, they held back because they were, I don't know whether they were, to say they were afraid is the right word or not, they certainly was concerned about how they would be painted, particularly by the American administration. I mean, in many respects, I, th I think it's probably true to say that at that particular time in history, that was the only administration in the world, apart from the Russians who were antagonistic, the American administration was the only one that Israel really cared about. I mean, the EU was nothing. You know, so its influence was nothing. The UN had proven itself, surprise, surprise, yet again to be totally useless, you know, even trying to prevent something like this. So there, there already Israel is in the position where it's in the thrall of a US administration and afraid to do what it actually knows it ought to do unless they get a sort of thumbs up from you know the American president and his administration. Absolutely, and also I, I think we can also say that um, that the the IDF had refocused on instead of f uh, dealing with a con kind of conventional warfare as they had in '67, more concentrating their efforts on uh, aviation, military aircraft. Uh, combating um, kind of ter terrorism then because of course in 72 we had the Munich yeah. massacre as well yeah. and a huge rise of Palestinian terrorism yes. uh, orchestrated by the PLO against Israel yes. and that's where they were they were focusing their efforts on there yeah. um, so they weren't actually expecting a conventional war but also we see overconfidence as well because Israel spent 40 uh, million US dollars to build what's known as the Bar Lev line yeah. Yeah. which was a defensive war of sand and it would believe that it would take over a day for the Egyptian forces not only to cross uh, the Suez Canal um, but then also get across this uh, mountain of, of sand um, but then we found out that <laughs> and this would allow Israel a day to mobilize its forces but instead yeah. what the Egyptian forces did was to use water cannons and of course it came down in no time yeah. so a, a, again are we it was a, a sense with Israel, this kind of overconfidence that... Yeah, I think there was an, probably there was an underestimation of what the enemy actually might be capable of. Now, whether you put that down to poor intelligence gathering or not um, listening to what the intelligence gatherers are actually telling you about the capabilities of the Egyptians and the Syrians, I don't know. It's interesting what you said because I've read one or two articles, again in, in preparation for the programme, who criticise some of the upper echelons of the IDF for 
going down the line that you described, that they were more in tune with the previous conflicts and actually weren't prepared for what actually unfolded. So obviously there's divided opinion in Israel as to the, the, um, the frailties of the system in preparing the nation for what actually uh, came about. Absolutely. And um, I mean, I've got some, some interesting facts. It wouldn't be the Middle East port if I didn't bring <laughs> facts to the table, would it, Robin? Um, so we've, uh, we've also got some uh, incredible um, archive footage, uh, and this is from the National Archive of the State of Israel. I've given us permission to air this, and they are uh, just newly released um, TV footage of the Yom Kippur War that occurred 50 years ago. Um, so according to my notes here, um, the IDF faced, uh, this is in the south in the Sinai, faced something um, like uh, 240 airstrikes by uh, Egyptian Syrian MiGs. Um, they faced 1,000 artillery um, bombardments, 2,000 tanks, 2,000 anti-artillery guns, anti-tank missile launchers um, that uh, fired at the east bank of the Suez Canal. Um, the airstrikes lasted for about 20 minutes. Artillery barrage continued for another 30 minutes. Um, and the first, uh, and they said in the first minute alone, more than 10,000 artillery shells fell on Israeli positions. And according to um, Yossi Horel, who was the Israeli sergeant at the station, said it was a frightening scene um, and it was beginning to rain shells of every type. Um, to, to share with us how horrific that would have been for those few Israeli soldiers yeah. Um, that were on the west side of the uh, uh, Suez Canal yeah. facing this barrage of rockets and missiles firing at their positions yeah. and struggling to call up reinforcements. Yeah, I mean, I, you and I would be familiar with the old black and white footage of these bombardments during World War I on the Western Front, plus some of the bombardments that went on in the English Channel prior to the D-Day landings. And you hear the testimony of men who are both German in D-Day and British and German in World War I. You know, the, the archive footage of those who testify as to what it was like to be on the receiving end of that. And it, it is literally bone shaking. The, your whole body is just vibrating uh, and the concussion that's going on. I mean, it, I don't think, and, and none of us who have not been in a conflict will ever fully understand what it's like to be on the receiving end of something like that. Absolutely, and the magnitude of forces yeah. as well. Yeah. Uh, was quite extraordinary. I mean, if we turn our attention really to the north, because mm. in the first a few days of the Yom Kippur War, um, the situation that Israel was facing was incredibly critical. Um, for example, here in the north of Israel, the Syrians invaded with some 1,400 tanks. Mm. Um, and there were only 180 IDF tanks to defend the north of Israel. And to put this in perspective, um, Israel uh, was facing the entire military might of Europe's NATO forces. This was the biggest tank battle that we've actually seen since the uh, uh, since the Second World War, when the Russians yeah, uh, counter-offensive yeah. the Battle of the Kursk yeah. uh, against the Nazis. Mm -hmm. um, incredible number of tanks mm -hmm. and, and soldiers that just um, entered the Golan Heights. Yeah. Um, share your thoughts, Rob. Well, again, I mean, we've, I, this I have seen, I've seen archive footage of this. There was a, a series, an Israeli series made about this that I watched some of, you know, a year or so ago, having watched it previously. And again, Israel is caught on the hop. Uh, uh, you know, these poor guys who are up on the Golan Heights are or, or on the approaches to the Golan Heights are seeing this mass of tanks rolling across up onto the heights from Syria. And they have so little that they can actually repel that with. It, again, it must have been totally terrifying as they wait for further reinforcements, you know, to move from other parts of the country, get back up there and, and start to help them repel it. And what was extraordinary as well that um, that the Syrian forces were only five minutes from actually reaching the uh, River Jordan, mm -hmm. and if they crossed over the River Jordan, then the whole of the uh, Galilee would have been exposed to the Soviet tanks yes. and, and, and forces. And of course, we have that incredible battle known as the uh, the Battle of the Valley of Tears. And having been there, 
Um, it's an extraordinary place. You still have the Israeli tanks um, that were involved in that battle. I mean, mm. we're, we're talking about a battle that lasted three days mm. um, and Israel was completely, utterly outnumbered yeah. um, during, during that uh, tank battle. I mean, the stories that have come out of that are just, they make the hair on the back of your neck sort of stand on end because you realize even if these men didn't realize it, and some of them did, I think in the end, cotton on, God was definitely involved in the defensive action on that particular front, because there was no way that small force could ever have withstood what was being thrown against it out of Syria. No way, apart from divine intervention. Definitely. Something like five tanks, uh, five Israeli tanks were actually confronting about 60 to 80 Syrian yeah. Tanks, yes. And this was the latest technology. This yep. is the latest Soviet technology mm -hmm. with anti-tank missiles as well. Yes. And the Israelis didn't think the Arabs actually had that capability. So it made it even worse. But then we see uh, what can only be described as the incredible intervention mm -hmm. uh, uh, of God. According to my notes here, um, one of the incredible miracles happened when uh, later in the war, when the, um, the IDF captured a commander of the uh, Syrian 9th Army. Um, and uh, he was interrogated by the Mossad and um, when asked why his armed forces had retreat, retreated, he replied that he saw an army of angels <laughs> surrounding those three Israeli tanks. So essentially there was nothing yes. to stop the Syrians from m marching forward mm -hmm. into the yeah. Galilee yeah. and yet three Israeli tanks were able to stop this huge yeah tank army and they turn back mm -hmm. um, and it's incredible I mean it, it's very similar to the the story of the Battle of the Mons uh, mm -hmm. during the First World War mm -hmm. where the German forces saw angelic uh, uh, angelic forces yeah. on horseback yeah I know it's just uh, just riding at them so yeah. again we see here yeah. God's divine intervention for yeah. all those people that were mm -hmm. praying for the peace of Jerusalem yes and of course that's another factor that you know we need to bring into this that <laughs> how do we put it, the pro-Israel movement, w whatever that was amongst evangelical believers, got into action, you know, as information starts to seep out through radio, through TV, there was a mobilization of people in the nations to pray and support Israel in prayer in the midst of this conflict because many people cottoned on to the fact how um, potentially disastrous this whole conflict could be. So let's uh, go to this excellent uh, CBN uh, news report and uh, this is an interview with one of, one of the Israeli uh, commanders uh, based up in the Golan Heights who faced this uh, barrage of uh, Syrian tanks and this is his remarkable story of how God delivered him and also his uh, comrades during that fight. Well, today marks the Jewish holiday called Yom Kippur. It is a time when Jews fast and pray that they'll be remembered in God's book of life for another year. For one Israeli general, it's also a day to remember God's protection on the battlefield. It happened during the 1973 Yom Kippur War. Chris Mitchell has the story. Like most Israelis just before the 1973 Yom Kippur War, Efi Yitam didn't expect a surprise Arab attack on the holiest day of the Jewish year. Itam was leading a routine reconnaissance patrol on the Golan Heights. Moments later, he would be facing the might of the Syrian army. I saw hundreds of Syrian tanks just moving forward. And they were painted in their camouflage of green and yellow. And I remember I thought myself as a kind of a prehistoric lizards, you know, who just came out of a cave because they came out of nowhere. I didn't see them before. For days, the surprise attack dealt a serious, nearly fatal blow to Israel. The men on the front lines bore the brunt of the battle. The first three days were hell, you know. We, we didn't have any anti-tank weapons, and we had to shoot them with American World War-made uh, bazookas, you know. It's a, it's a very primitive anti-tank rocket launcher, and we had to shoot them from distances of 50, 60 meters, and people just got killed. Some of them, some of them were smashed by the, by the tanks, you know, from such a short distance. The Israelis paid a high price in lives lost during the first few days of the war, but they held on and contained one of the most fearsome attacks ever made against the nation. When Israel counterattacked, Itam received orders for a daring mission. 
go miles behind enemy lines and take the Syrian division headquarters. Like many commando raids, this assault meant close quarters, face-to-face, -face, and sometimes hand-to-hand -hand combat. Itam was a highly trained soldier, but he wasn't prepared for what faced him when he went around a corner in the Syrian bunkers. We came there and we started to to clean, otherwise, other words, to kill the the commanders, the generals which were there and their guard. I was throwing hand grenades, shooting, you know, in the broad uh, concrete corridors. And then when I turned behind uh, one of the corners of the corridors, which was full of smoke and dust, I saw a silhouette, a kind of um, coming, something coming out of the dust and the smoke towards me. I was very sure it's a, it's a Syrian soldier. And I, 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 I took my rifle and I was aiming the rifle. I was ready to pull the trigger. And then I saw a bird coming out of the smoke. She just flew behind my hand and she stood on my right, right uh, shoulder. At first, the Tom thought the bird was actually a bat living in the cool, dark corridors of the bunker. So in the midst of an intense firefight, Itam found himself trying to shoo away a bird. So I just whipped her out, and she turned again and stood on my left shoulder. I didn't have time to have all kind of uh, argument with a bird. What are you doing here? Who are you? It was in the middle of a, of, of a, of a shooting battle. So I, I, I completed the assault and, and the hand grenades and everything. And when I went out of the, of the corridor of the, of the bunker, I saw a, a dove, a pigeon, standing on my, on my left shoulder. I, I, I just tried to let her out of my shoulder. She turned and she was very determined not to leave me. I, I put my hand just like that and she stood on my, on my, on my hand. Despite Itam's attempts to get rid of the dove, she stayed with him and his unit for the next 10 days in some of the most intense battles of the Yom Kippur War. During that time, Itam's unit appeared to have supernatural protection. Since we, we had that angel protecting us, none of my uh, company soldiers uh, was killed or, or, or wounded. And we were involved in very, in very intensive battle, battles. It's not that we, 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 we stood in the rear or we sat there. We were involved in the middle of the, of the most bitter battles, but she was there. What was unnatural and, and very interesting was that even in the night, when we had night operations and night battles, where, we, where usually these birds, pigeons, do not, uh, do not move at night. They don't have a very good uh, night uh, sight. Uh, she was with us, patrolling a little bit forward, looking what's going on around, sitting here. Finally, after nearly two weeks of frontline conflict, Itam and his unit were sent to the rear for a rest. And when I put my, my feet uh, down the vehicle which brought us from the front to to the territory of the state of Israel, she flew away and disappeared. Uh, you know, you could have a little bit of, of questions whether it's happened or not, but it didn't happen to me uh, in the middle of a desert or me being alone in the middle of a jungle. It was in front of the eyes of thousands of soldiers. Since that experience, through many special commando operations, the sense of the miraculous and God's protection has never left Itam. The same protection promised in the 23rd Psalm. I train myself to see miracles uh, around me, around the, uh, the operations which I conducted. It's as we know, gam ke lech al mavet lo even when I when I am in, in valley of death and evil, I'm not afraid because God is with me. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem.
And uh, that was absolutely an extraordinary story of uh, an IDF commander felt that he had that uh, divine protection because of a dove that stayed with him during the most intense conflict with the Syrian forces. Um, and when it comes to Israel, I mean, it's no surprise we see there that the, the God of Israel mm -hmm. is Israel's protection. And here we see more and more kind of miracles take place. And I think there's probably more miracles um, that took place mm -hmm. during the Yom Kippur War than any other uh, of Israel's wars. Mm. Yeah, I think you're right, Simon. I mean, just listening to this guy, I think I've seen that clip maybe once before, but it's a while, and it just, I don't know, it just sends a tingle up and down your spine, because you, from a logical, human point of view, that should never have happened. That bird <laughs> should never have stayed with that guy for you know, a couple of weeks. It's just totally, on the human level, it's totally irrational. What other explanation can you give other than it is a sign of God's presence with that particular unit? Now, you and I would have to acknowledge that there were other units that didn't experience that sort of, you know, divine presence. And therefore, you know, it's something that you is a mystery in the sense that God has revealed himself in that situation, but chosen not to in another. But you can, well, I'm sorry, you can, you can try and argue, but you cannot argue with that guy's testimony. And there's the photographs to prove it, you know? So yeah, it's just amazing. Absolutely, and of course his unit would also testify about yeah, of course. the dove as well. Yeah. Uh, and there's a, another miracle um, that took place uh, in the Golan Heights uh, involving um, IDF soldiers. Um, this is when IDF commander uh, David Yinni um, was in the process of pulling his troops out of confrontation with the Syrian army when he realised that they were trapped in a minefield. Knowing it would take a miracle for them to make it out alive, the troops began crawling on their bellies while using their bayonets to try and find the mines without setting them off. And anyone who's seen that situation is incredibly dangerous and precarious. Mm. And one of the soldiers uttered a heartfelt prayer. Mm. And the story goes that suddenly a, a windstorm blew in and the soldiers hunkered down until the storm subsided. When it did, it had blown away so much of the dirt that, my, that the mines were exposed mm. and the entire platoon managed to escape unharmed. Yeah. Um, I mean, isn't that incredible? Yeah, yeah, and those sort of things continue to happen. You know, we both know the story of the uh, the Iron Dome system that failed. I think it was either three or four times to intercept a, a, a missile that was heading for the heart of Tel Aviv. Yep, the Haredi Towers and in 2004. All of a sudden, there's a literally a puff of wind, and it blows it off course out into the Mediterranean Sea. God's hand at work still to this day. And if you go to Tel Aviv, there's hardly any wind. That's <laughs> yes, exactly. That's it's one of the almost humid, uh, uncomfortable uh, place, uh, places and to And also visit. during this um, conflict, there, there was also a, another miracle that mm. took place, and that was the fact that God had prepared the heart mm. of the US President Richard Nixon, a very controversial president, and, and, and the year that I was born was actually then um, disgraced in office mm. um, and had to kind of resign. Um, but he tells the story of his mother, that uh, his mother said, if you were ever in a position of power and influence, mm -hmm. um, and you're in a position to help the Jewish people, help the Jewish people. So mm -hmm. he got a desperate call mm -hmm. uh, from the then Israeli Prime Minister Golda Meir, and there's a new film that's come out uh, looking at a premiership called Golda. Mm -hmm. um, she called him in the middle of the night crying out for help, and that's when he remembered that one day he would be called upon to help the Jewish people in their hour of need. And he did this by supplying Israel with 800, um, 800 tanks, mm. 500 aircraft, 27,000 tons of munitions and other supplies. Mm. And he bypassed his uh, Secretary of State. Henry Kissinger, yes. who was actually Jewish, yes. um, in order to get Israel yeah. this much needed um, military supplies and relief yeah. so that they could push back the yeah. Syrian and the uh, uh, Egyptian advances. Yeah, I mean, he bypassed Kissinger, but he also bypassed you know, many others in his administration and in the Pentagon who you know, were totally against him taking, taking the decision. But thankfully, in the presidential system, the way it is in the States, you know, the president has a certain amount of clout that he can over... Um, you know, ignore this 
and, and say, no, do it, you know, and yeah, it, on a, again, on a human military level, it was part of the salvation of the Jewish nation that it, they were able to be resupplied, definitely. And also share, share with us the kind of shameful response of the British government at the time that actually refused to actually allow the uh, US military aircraft to land yeah. uh, in Britain at one of, their, one of the US army bases to refuel there before flying on to Israel. It wasn't only Britain, but it was also um, virtually all the European countries. Yeah, I mean, we, we obviously in a time of oil embargoes, you know, the Arab nations, oil producing nations, threatening to cut off oil supplies. And unfortunately, our government kowtowed to these pressures and uh, yeah, sadly, as you say, Simon, one of many incidences since the 1920s where the British government of the day has, has not fulfilled its obligations, even on a humanitarian level, has not fulfilled its obligations for all sorts of reasons. I mean, you and I know that embedded into the you know, Foreign and Commonwealth Office, there is an anti-Israel, pro-Arab um, spirit and influence that no matter what um, decisions, moves, you know, a minister may come out and talk about, actually the Foreign and Commonwealth Office will, will undermine it, will block it, will, you know, will seek to, to interfere with it. And this has been going on for decades. And um, yeah, well, maybe as a nation, we're reaping the fruit of that these, in these days. And, and, and sadly, the only um, territory in Europe that the Americans could land their uh, military aircraft on was the Azores, uh, and that was off the coast of Portugal. No other European nation would allow yeah. Israel to, yeah. to um, sorry, the Americans to land with the military supplies that Israel desperately needed. Yeah. Um, I, I think you're right. That's a combination of the um, threats of oil embargoes, particularly by OPEC and the Arab states. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it was also the fact that Europe had to deal with uh, terrorism uh, of the PLO, and so yeah. therefore they were afraid of upsetting the, uh, mm -hmm. the PLO, yeah. uh, which would then carry out more terrorist attacks. Because yes. we see yeah. that across Europe, the French, uh, you know, the Germans, and other European nations would pay the PLO huge millions and millions of pounds mm -hmm. in order for them not to carry out terrorist attacks on their territories. And one of the important things maybe to just draw out from what you just said is that up until 1963, 64, Palestinians didn't exist. They are a creation both of the Soviet Union and the Arab nations in 63 and 64, when the PLO was organized and Arafat started to rise to the top. So, you know, some of the things that, that we, uh, you know, you and Revelation TV and the programs that you do are contending with as far as Palestinianism today only started at pr just prior, you know, to the 67 conflict and then again rose to the surface again in the 73 conflict. Uh, and also what was quite incredible is that as the war kind of dragged on um, towards its uh, climax, uh, the Israeli forces or the IDF had turned the whole situation around. Mm. I think there were only less than uh, kind of, um, uh, is it uh, probably 30 miles away from Damascus, yeah. um, up in the Golan Heights, gone yeah. onto the Golan Heights, into Syria, mm. and actually was threatening um, the, the Syrian regime itself, and possibly could have gone on and well, taken I mean, Damascus. And, and also Amman and, and Jordan well. and Cairo, all three capitals were within range of Israeli forces. And that's, again, surprise, surprise, when the Americans step into the situation and turn the screws on and say, you've got to stop guys, you have to stop. And of course, one of the, um, one of the generals to make a name for himself during the Yom Kippur <laughs> War was uh, the late uh, Errol Sharon, mm -hmm. who was able to uh, rescue the Israeli forces um, that were tied down by the Egyptians. And then of course, what he did then was, was stunningly using his dinghies to cross the river Nile and then completely encircled the Egyptian Third Army and took mm. them by some complete surprise mm. and put sh uh, clear blue water between the IDF then the self and then the Egyptian forces themselves and right. they're only 80 miles away from Cairo. Oh, yeah. um, so if the Israelis had the political will mm -hmm. uh, and the military will, could have gone on and taken down Anwar. Yeah. So that's yes. a regime in Cairo, could have sent the IDF into Damascus, <laughs> And that would have sent shockwaves through yeah. the Arab capitals I and mean, the Arab world. 
it boggles the mind, you know, to think all of these years later as to what the ripple effects of that might have been, you know, what if. So we now got uh, an excellent um, IDF uh, video to go to. This one's entitled History Today, uh, the Yom Kippur Wars. We mark the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War that occurred on Saturday, the 6th of October, 1973. <laughs> And uh, that archive of footage is thanks to the IDF. So thank you very much for the IDF as uh, we look back at the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War. Um, Robin, the legacy of the uh, Yom Kippur in terms of Israeli casualties, uh, mm. we're looking at 2,800 lives, 8,800 wounded. Um, Israel was able to turn that war around. Um, they won the military victory but soon after lost the political victories. We saw that uh, OPEC decided to impose an oil blo um, blockade on, uh, on Europe, and we saw the price of petrol go through the roof, and of course news footage then of uh, cars queuing up at petrol stations for oil. The price of oil went through the roof, and the Arabs then were using a kind of economic weapon mm. um, against the West. And of course then, this is when Israel lost the, uh, the political battle and she wasn't able to capitalize on her military gains mm. um, and this was pretty much thanks to uh, the Secretary of State at the time, Henry Kissinger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think, I mean, the legacy that we live, that like Israel, okay, okay, we're armchair generals, okay, inverted commas, totally removed from the situation, commenting on it today. But looking at Israel today, it seems to me that one of the legacies is that as Israel behaved in 73 in almost being, again, I hate to use the word, but fearful of doing a preemptive, Israel is still fearful of taking preemptive action. Again, very much to please an American administration that certainly since the new administration came into being has proven itself to be one of Israel's worst enemies rather even though it spouts out verbally that it's a friend its actions uh, both on the international stage and the pressures that Israel is is being put under by the Biden administration it is not a friend of the nation of Israel and Israel I think one of, the th one, of the, one of the differences between 67 and 73 was Israel was willing in 67 to take preemptive action to protect itself. It was willing to take the risk. And, and it had the green, almost, it was known as the amber light on behalf of yes. the uh, US president yeah. at the time. But, but it seems when we got to 73 and since, Israel is reluctant to take the risk for fear of, of what the rebound will be in, in, on its international reputation. And that's a dangerous place to be for a Jewish state. A Jewish state that the bulk of the world either could not care less about or is actually openly hostile to it. Yeah, we've got a handful of nations that appear, certainly on the surface, they move their embassies to Jerusalem or they're talking about doing it. We have a handful of nations in that category, but the bulk of the rest of the, of the nations of the world, 
are not Israel's friend. And I think, without wanting to sound apocalyptic, Israel in the maybe not too distant future will face that hard choice, particularly when it comes to the Iranian regime and, and all of the involvement that it has in seeking to destroy the Jewish people and the nation state of Israel. Israel is going to come to the crossroads and it's going to have to choose, are we going to have to take preemptive action against Iran, whatever the rest of the world, including the Biden administration or whoever's in the White House at that stage, or are we just going to suck it up and take it? And of course, also uh, involving uh, terrorist proxies as well, yeah. Hezbollah in the North. Well, that's why I say Iran Hamas, is behind it all. But when we reflect on the, uh, on the past 50 years and mm. the legacy of the Yom Kippur War, the one thing we can say without a shadow of a doubt is that we saw God's deliverance. Yes. We saw miracles take place yes. during that war. We saw God's divine hand of protection over his nation and over his people. And it's a reminder, isn't it, that, that, he, that he who watches Israel neither yeah, slumbers nor sleeps. And, and how and important is this? And, we've seen, it, and that we've seen we that repeatedly. Yeah from time to time, repeatedly over the last 50 years. So in that sense, God has not changed. But God uses human beings. God will use the IDF to protect the nation of Israel and to deal with Israel's enemies. Uh, Robin, I, I think you've unpacked uh, very well the, uh, the Yom Kippur War of uh, 1973 very well. So I really appreciate uh, you coming on and uh, talking about this historic date uh, in the Israeli calendar, which marked the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War. And I want to thank you all for watching this edition of the Middle East Report as we mark the 50th anniversary of the Yom Kippur War, where we saw God's hand of deliverance over the Jewish people when they were invaded by both Syria and Egypt, and the situation was desperate. But Israel was able to turn it around thanks to the incredible prayers of intercessors around the world. And uh, as we reflect on the Yom Kippur War, it's a reminder that we need to pray for the peace of Jerusalem. So thank you for watching this week's edition of the Middle East Report.